Hi, everyone. Welcome to From the U.S. to Australia, Animal Protection Legislation Across the World. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Alicia Pragoski, and I am a Senior Legislative Affairs Manager at the Animal Legal Defense Fund. I would like to introduce our speakers. Alice D. Concetto founded Animal Law Europe a consultancy based in Brussels, Belgium, specializing in EU animal law and policy. There she serves as a European animal law specialist to major EU-based animal protection nonprofits and public administrations. She's also a lecturer in animal law at the Sorbonne Law School. Over the past two years working in public affairs, Alice has achieved the inclusion of additional provisions in favor of farm animal welfare in the EU Green Deal. Marty McKendry is a lawyer and parliamentary advisor to two Canadian senators, the Honorable Pierre Delfond and the Honorable Marty Klein. He previously worked with former Senator Murray Sinclair to draft and introduce Bill S-218, the Jane Goodall Act, now sponsored by Senator Klein. He also worked with former Senator Wilfred Moore to draft and advance Bill S-203, the Ending the Captivity of Whales and Dolphins Act which was enacted into law. Tess Vickery is a commercial and class action lawyer turned animal law specialist from Sydney, Australia. She has a master's of animal law from Lewis and Clark Law School and is currently working as policy advisor to the Honorable Emma Hurst, MLC, a politician representing the Australian Animal Justice Party. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Before we begin with a presentation from Alice, I have the great honor of sharing a message from Congressman Earl Blumenauer. Congressman Blumenauer is a true animal protection champion. He is co-chair of the Congressional Animal Protection Caucus and has introduced and co-sponsored many bills to protect animals. Those include the Saving America's Pollinators Act, the Big Cat Public Safety Act, the Humane Cosmetic Act, and several bills to protect the environment and endangered species. One particularly notable piece of legislation that Congressman Blumenauer is leading the charge on is the Captive Primate Safety Act, which he will address momentarily. We are so grateful for Congressman Blumenauer's tireless work to protect animals, and we hope that you enjoy his inspirational message. Greetings, I'm Congressman Earl Blumenauer. I want to thank the Animal Legal Defense Fund for hosting this webinar and for all of you for tuning in to learn more about our fight for animal welfare and safety. This is a topic that impacts all of us because the way we treat animals reflects the values that we hold and has a huge impact on the livability of our communities. That's why I'm fully committed to bringing the mission to protect wild and domestic animals as well as endangered species and their habitats to Congress. As the co-chair of the Bipartisan Congressional Animal Protection Caucus, I'm proud to be leading and working to build consensus around a number of key animal welfare bills. That includes the Captive Primate Safety Act, which would strengthen existing protections to prohibit interstate commerce and private ownership of monkeys, apes, and primates. The need for this legislation is clear not only because of serious concern over the health of these animals when they are kept as pets, but because in multiple instances, they have attacked people, causing serious bodily harm. In Connecticut in 2009, a woman named Charla Nash had her face ripped off by a pet chimpanzee of a neighbor, despite behavior in the past that was clearly menacing. This is one of many examples where action is needed to not only protect the animals, but ensure the health and safety of our neighbors. And I hope you will join us in these fights. I'm going to keep leading the charge on these issues in Congress, and I'm looking forward to working alongside the Animal Legal Defense Fund and all of you along the way. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, um, thank you so much to the organizers of the Animal Law Conference for inviting me to speak today. 
My presentation is about EU animal welfare legislation, which is often presented as a model around the world. And by focusing on the EU, I really want us uh, during this presentation to question the extent to which animal welfare legislation in general contributed to advancing the interests of animals, if at all. Um, this is a particularly timely question, given that the EU is in the process of revising its animal welfare legislation. And hopefully this revision will result in a framework that goes beyond the, tra the traditional approach to animal protection, that is beyond animal welfareism, um, a concept that in my opinion has been widely captured by the industry. During my presentation, I will uh, first walk you through the general framework of EU farm animal welfare legislation and its shortcomings. And I will then um, present the changes that we can foresee in the next few years under the influence of the Green Deal and what this actually entails on the legal and practical treatment of farmed animals in the EU. Before we dive in in the current laws in place in the EU, I'd like to provide you with a little bit of a historical background as to where these laws come from, which I think is really useful to uh, in understanding the principles, but also the constraints that underpin EU farm animal welfare legislation. All of EU farm animal welfare legislation in the EU is grounded in the convention of another international European organization, which predates the EU and which is called the Council of Europe. I won't get into the details of this organization. All you have to know is that countries like Russia, Turkey are members of the Council of Europe as well as all the EU countries. There are three conventions of the Council of Europe on farm animal welfare. The first one is the European Convention for the Protection of Animals During Transport. The second one is the European Convention for the Protection of Animals Kept for Farming Purposes. And the third one is the European Convention for the Protection of Animals for Slaughter. What's interesting to note is that what prompted the enactment of these conventions was the necessity to protect animals, and I quote, particularly in modern intensive livestock farming systems. This convention therefore already identifies the central issue of placing sentient beings in settings that treat them like commodities. We're in 1976, so it is pretty forward thinking for the time. The EU is the only jurisdiction to have integrated these conventions into its legislation. The first piece of legislation on animal welfare in EU law was a law on slaughter in 1974, which was followed by a law on the protection of animals during transport in 77. And then from the early 90s to the late 2000s, the EU had adopted a series of laws on the protection of pigs in particular, farmed animals in general, egg-laying hens, broiler chickens, and calves. So if we look at EU farm animal welfare legislation today, this is what we have. One pretty general act that sets minimum rules for all farmed animals, for all farming purposes. Five species specific acts for hens, calves, pigs, and broiler chickens and two acts regulating the treatment of animals during two specific segments of production, which are transport and slaughter. Note that there is no species specific regulation for aquatic animals or dairy cows, which would be, I mean, they are covered under the first act, the Directive 9858, uh, concerning the protection of animals kept for farming purposes, as well as the two regulations on transport and slaughter. If we were to compare the EU to other jurisdictions when it comes to uh, farm animal welfare legislation, the EU looks like a, it has a pretty comprehensive legislative framework when it comes to farm animal welfare legislation. So if we compare it to the US, for instance, it looks like a more complete set of legislation. However, just because animal welfare legislation is better compared to other jurisdictions, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is satisfactory. So let's now turn to the important limitations contained in EU farm animal welfare laws. 
So we saw that EU laws on animal welfare were derived from international conventions that acknowledged the specific need to protect animals from systemic abuse in factory farms. Yet, a striking feature of the EU farm animal welfare laws is how accommodating their provisions are towards industrial farm animal production. Starting with extreme confinement. The egg-laying hens legislation still allows the use of cages. They are called enriched cages, and they are slightly deeper than conventional cages and are equipped with enriched materials that are, that are supposed to answer the animal's behavioral needs. That's what an enriched cage looks like compared to a conventional cage. They are both what we would call battery cages, and today, 50% of egg-laying hens in the EU are still kept in cages. The use of cage is also lawful in pork production, as EU legislation allows the use of both gestation and furring crates for sows. All sorts of mutilations are still allowed on EU farms, tail docking, tooth clipping, castration without anesthesia on pigs, but also de-beaking on birds and dehorning of cattle. All killing methods are allowed in the EU, including the grinding of animals, the thumping of small animals, the use of electrical water bath for poultry and carbon dioxide for pigs, even though, interestingly, the EU legislature agrees that those two methods, so carbon dioxide for pigs and electrical water bath for poultry, should be phased out on account of the suffering that they generate in animals. A quick note on aquatic animals. So as I said before, there are no species-specific rules for aquatic animals, but they are covered in the General Act on Animal Welfare, as well as the two regulations on transport and slaughter. However, they are in fact excluded from virtually all the provisions in those acts. An interesting case are cephalopods which are included in the scope of the legislation on the protection of animals used for scientific purposes, but not included in the scope of the directive on farmed animals. So, for instance, an octopus that you would use for in the context of scientific experiments will have more protection than if it is used for human consumption purposes. So, given the short, the important, significant shortcomings of EU animal welfare legislation, some EU countries have uh, implemented stricter standards in their own national laws. This is the case, for instance, for Austria, Germany, Luxembourg, and Czechia, which have all banned the use of cages in egg production. Sweden has also banned the use of cages and mutilations in pork production. And Finland and Lithuania have enacted a strict ban on tail docking and uh, have actually uh, lowered density levels on farms. However, under EU law, under the EU's constitutional commerce clause, if you will, states do not have the ability to ban the sale of products um, that comply with EU law, even in cases where such products do not comply with national laws. So, this rule was actually reminded in an important ruling in 1998. Um, and this is, of course, one big difference with U.S. law and one that sets the EU behind the U.S. in terms of potential progress for animals, as in the current state of EU law, bans such as those that were passed in California would be unlawful in the EU. So now that we've seen how limited EU farm animal welfare laws have been in regulating factory farming, let's now look at the changes that the revision could bring about. First, I'd like to explain how this reform came about through the Green Deal and what the EU Green Deal is exactly. And one helpful way I've found to understand this is to use the metaphor of an onion or a nesting doll to help us navigate the different governance and policy layers until we finally get to those measures that we're interested in. So the EU Green Deal seeks to implement the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals in the EU. The objectives of those goals is to achieve climate neutrality. To that effect, 
The Green Deal in the EU provides general policy orientations in a large array of policy areas, including food and agriculture. The policy measures for food and agriculture are nested under a specific policy program called the Farm to Fork Strategy, which was published in May of last year, at the heart of the COVID-19 pandemic, interestingly. Now, within that policy are different measures and objectives, and I will focus, of course, on the measures that affect the treatment of animals. So perhaps the main uh, measure for farmed animals would be the revision of EU farm animal welfare legislation, including, and I quote, on animal transport and the slaughter of animals to align it with the latest scientific evidence, broaden its scope, make it easier to enforce, and ultimately ensure a higher level of animal welfare. So based on the latest documents that the European Commission, which is the executive branch of the EU, submitted to the public for comments, the revision will likely encompass more than the two regulations on transport and slaughter, and will also include on-farm uh, animal welfare rules. The European Commission also expressed that it was considering enacting additional species-specific rules on the welfare of dairy cows and fish, for instance. So that was for the, the scope. And now for the substance, the European Commission also announced that it would phase out the use of cages in animal agriculture. And this specific uh, measure came through what's called the European Citizens Initiative, which is pretty similar to uh, ballot initiatives in the US. So this is obviously a positive development for two reasons. I mean, the first one we saw because uh, of the limitations of, current of the current regulatory framework that you know, we mentioned before. And also the second reason is that this revision is an opportunity to update uh, animal welfare legislation in light of the new constitutional treaty of 2009 which not only recognizes animal sentience, but also imposes a duty on the Union to take into account the welfare of animals in formulating and implementing the Union's policy. Another central measure of the EU Green Deal for farmed animals is the creation of an animal welfare label. This label will likely be voluntary. This means that producers producers will choose whether they want to use that label. And from an animal law perspective, this proposal raises concerns. Um, first, this label might only add to the proliferation of existing labels in, in the EU countries. Second, it might compete with already existing labels that effectively guide consumers' purchasing choices already. And third, this label might actually even contribute to misleading consumers into thinking that they buy ethical human products, when really it could be that the producers barely go beyond legal standards, and we've seen that such standards are already very low to begin with. So let's now look at uh, how to reform the treatment of animals under the law beyond animal welfare legislation in a more systemic way. In the Green Deal, the European Commission correctly identifies that in the EU, average intakes of red meat continue to exceed recommendations and that moving to a more plant-based diet with less red and processed meat and with more fruits and vegetables will reduce not only the risk of threatening diseases, but also the environmental impacts of the food system. However, the EU Green Deal measures on food and agriculture contain almost no reference to the agricultural policy, which really is the one and only policy that effectively influences the consumption and production of food, as well as the number of animals used for food. Instead, the strategy exclusively focuses on consumption and consumer information. The Green Deal talks about implementing all sorts of food label. We've talked about the animal welfare label, but the Green Deal also considers implementing a nutritional label, a food sustainability label, and all of that in addition to already existing labels such as the organic label. On the other hand, the Commission doesn't commit 
to ending its own publicly funded campaigns that aim to increase consumption levels of inhumane food products. This is an example of such a campaign that has been running in Spain, Portugal, and France, um, and which encourages young consumers to consume more pork. This campaign is particularly problematic because it really plays out on people's need to have access to reliable information. And it says here basically that the EU has the best animal welfare standards in the world, which of course might be true, considering that it is probably the only jurisdiction to have actually codified common industry practices into law. But as we saw before, these laws don't really improve the treatment of animals, they rather normalize common cruel industry practices. There are also um, important gaps in the Green Deal when it comes to food and agriculture. For instance, the European Commission doesn't discuss uh, ending subsidies that support industrial farm animal production, such as the subsidies to ensure cheapness of animal feed, or the subsidies that go to support investment to build industrial farms. Um, the EU doesn't uh, consider re-establishing a cap on milk production, let alone establishing a cap on meat production. And it doesn't either uh, discuss uh, ending support programs such as the EU school scheme for milk, which is similar to uh, the USDA's lunch program, school lunch program in the US. Um, which is basically a program whereby the government bulk purchase milk to redistribute it under many forms in, in school cafeterias, which has the effect of both incentivizing production and overproduction and influencing consumption patterns. So to wrap up this presentation, a few take-home messages. Uh, first, the EU has quite a comprehensive legislative framework when it comes to farm animal welfare, but there remains important gaps in the substance and enforcement as well, which I haven't really touched upon during this presentation, but those issues exist as well. The EU committed to revise some of the farm animal welfare laws, which is a positive step. However, at a more systemic level, the EU executive doesn't really implement a shift to a more plant-based diet through the one policy that could enable such a shift, the EU agricultural policy. And finally, for those who are more curious, on how to approach the issue of industrial animal agriculture in a systemic way, I'd like to let you know about an exciting project I have been working on with the Jeremy Collar Foundation, which is the creation of an online database that lists better practice laws and policies, as well as fact sheets on the topics of animal welfare, antibiotics used, and food and climate policies. So feel free to, you know, go on cav.law to um, really check out this amazing resource. Thank you all for your attention, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you to the organizers and those tuning in. I'm speaking to you from Ottawa, Ontario, on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. As Alicia mentioned, I'm a lawyer and parliamentary advisor to two Canadian senators, the Honorable Marty Klein and the Honorable Pierre Dalfon. My presentation will outline three major and recent legislative developments in animal law in Canada at the federal level that I have worked closely on. First, I'll speak about the 2019 law banning whale and dolphin captivity for entertainment purposes through Bill S-203. Second, I'll touch on the ban on importing shark fins, also passed in 2019. Third, last year, Senator Murray Sinclair introduced the Gene Goodall Act, Bill S-218, to establish legal protections for captive great apes, elephants, and other non-domesticated species, such as big cats. This legislative framework builds directly on the whale and dolphin laws and can cover many animals through a regulatory power to extend the protections to other species. This provision is called the NOAA Clause. As well, the Jane Goodall Act will ban the import of elephant ivory and hunting trophies following the lead of many other countries further to Dr. Goodall's 2019 call to action in Canada. Perhaps most exciting, 
the Gene Goodall Act would establish limited legal standing for affected species. The bill would grant animals an advocate to make submissions on their behalf in sentencing for captivity offenses and empower courts to impose conditions or to relocate animals with costs. The preamble of the bill also acknowledges the jurisdiction of Canadian provinces to enact full legal standing in civil or regulatory contexts, such that the animals would have standing outside of criminal proceedings. For example, if Ontario passed such a law, Kiska, Canada's only captive orca, could be relocated to the whale sanctuary planned at Port Hilford, Nova Scotia. I am currently working as an advisor to Senator Klein in advancing the Jane Goodall Act, as he has sponsored the bill with Senator Seclair's retirement. As I believe most viewers are American, I would also note that both Senator Sinclair and Senator Klein are Indigenous leaders in Canada. Reconciliation with Indigenous peoples is currently a major national priority in our country, following the finding of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that a cultural genocide occurred here. The Commission stated that reconciliation must include reconciliation with nature. As self-governance is restored and Indigenous representation increases in legislatures, Indigenous leadership around animal welfare initiatives is an exciting development. I would highlight the Jane Goodall Act's foundation in Indigenous values of connection to nature, as stated in the bill's preamble. Definitely, without a doubt, the whale ban and the Jane Goodall Act would not have happened without Indigenous leadership as part of the political coalition behind the successes thus far. Perhaps there are opportunities to work with Indigenous communities and jurisdictions in other countries around animal welfare and environmental protection. As examples of Indigenous-led legal innovations, in 2018, the White Earth Nation in Minnesota granted legal rights to wild rice. This year in Canada, the Inu Council of Ikwanichi granted legal personhood to the Magpie River, with similar developments in New Zealand, India, and elsewhere. I'll now get more into the substance of the bills. At the outset, Though, I would emphasize that these three legislative models can be readily pursued in other jurisdictions. Everyone involved with the whale captivity ban, for example, is hoping to see similar attempts in other countries, uh, states, or cities. If there is any way I can help with such efforts, please be in touch through the organizers, or you can find me on LinkedIn. For example, I'm happy to provide policy and communications materials for mounting legislative campaigns. On a practical note, it would be particularly great to see efforts in the United States to catch up with Canadian law on whale captivity because belugas are being relocated to the U.S. from marine land in Niagara Falls, Canada. Once outside Canada, the whales no longer have the protection of the breeding and performance bans, but that could change with new American laws. On that note, what are Canada's whale and dolphin laws? Through the leadership of Senator Wilfred Moore and Senator Sinclair, in Canada, whale and dolphin captivity is now a crime of animal cruelty, unless licensed for either their best interests or for scientific research. The law was grandfathered in, such that whales and dolphins in Canada remain in place. There is only one facility currently holding cetaceans in Canada, being marine land with about 40 belugas, five dolphins, and one orca, Kiska, who I have mentioned. The laws comprise bans on captures, breeding, and use and performance for entertainment. A conviction is subject to a criminal record and a fine of up to 200,000 Canadian dollars, which of course are slightly less valuable than American dollars. The laws also prohibit import or export of whales and dolphins, or the reproductive materials, except if licensed for their best interests or for scientific research. For example, Whales could be imported to the Nova Scotia Whale Sanctuary I mentioned earlier, and I know the president and founder, Dr. Lori Marino, is also presenting at this conference. Also important, Dr. Marino and marine scientists were the key witnesses at the Senate committee hearings on the bill. I would strongly recommend pursuing any animal welfare legislative advocacy through arguments based in biological science about the nature and ecological needs of animals and evidence of harms. It is very difficult to argue against science, of course, uh, at least in a credible way. I should also note that the bill took place in the wake of the film Blackfish, which of course shocked public opinion on whale captivity. 
Other key elements of the coalition behind the bill included national and international animal welfare organizations, grassroots supporters, and former trainers, especially Phil Demers, formerly of Marineland, as profiled in the Hot Docs winning uh, film, The Walrus and the Whistleblower. I recommend watching that, including as the film covers the legislative fight to pass the bill. And I would emphasize it was a huge fight. The legislative battle to pass Bill S-203, the Ending the Captivity of Whales and Dolphins Act, was in fact the longest successful legislative process in Canadian history at nearly four years. Major factors to success were media coverage, social media, and grassroots passion. In fact, the bill was nearly defeated many times. On one occasion, grassroots supporters sent in so many emails to senators that it crashed the Senate server, decisively saving the bill by inspiring action from supportive senators. For anyone pursuing a bill like this, I would recommend having strategies for Twitter, Facebook, and letter writing campaigns to office holders uh, to show them that the public cares. Another key element was, of success was that Ontario had already banned new orca captivity and Vancouver banned cetacean captivity at the Vancouver Aquarium about halfway through. This all generated momentum and built the case for the bigger policy and ultimately a major legislative precedent. In terms of structuring a bill, I would also strongly recommend the model of prohibitions with the potential for licensing for justifiable reasons. Such a model makes legal sense because it expands animal cruelty laws and trade controls that exist in any comparable jurisdictions. The model is also very difficult to argue against. Capturing wild cetaceans and keeping them in concrete tanks is increasingly regarded as extremely cruel. This justifies the general ban and licensing is flexible enough for case-by-case -case transfers of individuals to better homes with public accountability for the political office holder granting licenses and the potential of judicial review in the exercise of that executive discretion. This brings me to the final point on the whale bill regarding export permits from Canada. Some viewers may be aware that a few months ago, five belugas were exported from Marineland to Mystic Aquarium in Connecticut. On August 6th, one of those whales died, apparently from a pre-existing condition. The whales were transferred to an export license granted for scientific research with a commitment not to breed or use them in performance. However, shortly after arrival, the aquarium president indicated in the press that he hopes to allow the whales to reproduce. It is also relevant that Marineland is currently subject to animal welfare orders relating to poor water quality and video of Kiska of the isolated uh, orca's heartbreaking behavior has gone viral on social media. All of these considerations speak to the need for a more transparent process around export permits from the Canadian government, the need for sanctuary capacity, and the need for stronger laws in the U.S. to protect cetaceans from captivity. I'll turn to a very brief word on the shark fin import ban. In 2019, Canada became the first G20 country to ban the import of shark fins. As is widely known, sharks are being driven to extinction by overfishing and cutting off a shark's fins for soup is cruel and wasteful. All that to say, other countries can adopt the same policy, and this seems perhaps like low-hanging fruit. One aspect of the issue, for example, is that it raises both welfare and conservation concerns, and that helps build social consensus towards change. Now I'll move on to the Jean Goodall Act. We'll please go to the first clip of Senator Sinclair's speech on the bill. Honorable Senators, Jane Goodall is a hero who inspires us to do better by all creatures of creation with whom we share this earth. Today, animals face mass extinction and cruelty at human hands. We must respond with empathy and justice. We must change course, both for their sake and for our own well-being. In many Indigenous cultures, we use the phrase, all my relations to express the interdependency and interconnectedness of all life forms and our relationship of mutual reliance and shared destiny. When we treat animals well, we act with both self-respect and mutual respect. Today, I ask this chamber to protect our animal relations with Bill S-218, named for my hero and yours, and a hero to your children and your grandchildren, 
as the Jane Goodall Act. I cannot overstate how exciting it is that Senator Sinclair and Dr. Goodall have teamed up on this bill. Senator Sinclair is one of the country's most prominent Indigenous leaders, as the former chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and a longtime judge. And of course, Dr. Goodall is a legendary hero for animals. This opportunity to change animal law in a big way is very exciting. The legislative framework builds directly on the framework for whales and dolphins. Bill S-218 protects great apes and elephants with animal cruelty and trade prohibitions on new captivity, except if licensed for their best interests with regard to both individual welfare and conservation, or if licensed for non-harmful scientific research. The bill also bans uh, the use of affected species in performance and conveyance, covering elephant rides. Notably, African Lion Safari gave up doing elephant rides in July, effectively ending the practice in Canada. And it's also notable that there had been attack, an attack at that uh, facility a few years ago. The framework for the Gene Goodall Act is notable as it may apply differently to elephants and great apes as drafted. In the case of elephants, Senator Sinclair commented that because elephants at four locations in Canada are kept inside in the winter and in isolation or small groups at three locations, no licenses should be granted for new elephant captivity in Canada. He also commented that quite a few of the elephants uh, in captivity in Canada were in fact taken from the wild. So the bill would likely result in a phase out though new captivity would be legally possible for elephants if licensed. In the case of great apes, Senator Sinclair commented that new captivity would depend on the merits of conservation and science programs at the three Canadian zoos where gorillas and orangutans are kept. New captivity could also occur at sanctuaries, and the bill has the endorsement of fauna, which is a, a sanctuary for chimpanzees near Montreal. If licenses were granted, there could also be conditions. For example, in Toronto, the orangutans do not have outdoor access, and one individual has been there since the 1970s. So outdoor access could be a condition for new captivity. As the bill is drafted, these protections could be extended to other non-domesticated species, such as big cats or bears. In adding animals, the bill directs government to consider whether a species can live a good life in captivity in consultation with scientists, veterinarians or animal care professionals, and animal welfare groups. Under the NOAA clause, a designated animal must also share some similarities with either great apes, elephants, or cetaceans that are relevant to their welfare in captivity, affording the government broad and flexible discretion to protect many species. I would emphasize that Senator Sinclair expressed great respect for the role of animal care professionals in bringing this legislation forward, and the text of the bill reflects that. He and Senator Klein are very much hoping that credible zoos with conservation and science programs will support the bill. On that note, let's please uh, go to clip two. In making these proposals, let me be clear. This bill is not necessarily at odds with all zoos. Rather, it is for animals. Credible zoos employ people who love animals and have dedicated their lives to their care and who contribute to conservation and science. They have helped save species like the California condor and black-footed ferrets. Today, I look to credible zoos as potential partners as we establish legal protections for animals that more closely reflect our moral obligations. Some animal care professionals may find this legislation helpful in requiring management to improve conditions. The public may prefer to visit animals protected by this bill. Some zoos, particularly private zoos, may not be suitable homes for some species, or a sanctuary model may be preferable. In thinking about captivity for display or entertainment, I would emphasize that we cannot put economic activity above our own humanity we have a responsibility to other beings. As I said, the bill would also ban the import of elephant ivory and hunting trophies. An exciting development on that point is that in July, the federal government announced public consultations on this subject, a promising sign. I would also note that Senator Klein is currently exploring ways to potentially further address wildlife trafficking through the bill as the legislation moves forward. 
Senate hearings on the bill may be possible next year, including with Dr. Goodall and Senator Sinclair, and that will be the big goal ahead. For anyone wanting to learn more about the details and philosophy of the Jane Goodall Act, I would recommend watching or reading Senator Sinclair's uh, very detailed 45-minute speech on the bill, and I'm happy to provide those links. Finally, I would say a few words about the bill's proposal for limited legal standing for affected species. This measure has some similarity to efforts to establish legal personhood for great apes and elephants through habeas corpus in the common law. However, the proposal in this bill is limited because the standing occurs in criminal sentencing for animal cruelty offenses. Under the bill, one conviction would be sufficient to relocate any individuals of the same or similar species from the offender's facility. For example, if a beluga were used illegally in performance, any cetaceans could be relocated from that facility to either you know, a different facility or to a sanctuary. As regards uh, legal standing for these species, this is what is possible under the federal jurisdiction in Canada with the criminal and import powers. Provinces could go further, as I noted, such as to legislate uh, rights or a regulatory framework for the orca kiska. Habeas corpus would be another possible approach and all of these efforts are uh, complementary in many ways. Progress for animals in any jurisdiction is progress for animals in all jurisdictions, since international precedents build the ethical and legal case uh, for the relevant species everywhere. With that, uh, thank you again to the organizers, and I would please close with the final clip of Senator Sinclair's speech on the path forward for the Jane Goodall Act. Thank you. Senators, we live in a time of great challenge with the natural world in peril. However, we also live in a time of great hope with social values increasing a moral and spiritual awakening. We can yet save this beautiful planet along with indigenous cultures and knowledge and the sacred and innocent animals who deserve our compassion. In moving this bill forward, Jane Goodall and I believe that the most powerful advocates eventually will be youth including her Roots and Shoots organization. Disrespect for animals is taught behavior, and we may find that children have a lesson to teach us. My grandchildren, quite frankly, are excited about this bill, and I hope yours will be too. For any parents and teachers listening across the country, we want to hear from your kids as we look to rediscover their forgotten wisdom about animals. Hi everyone, I'm so thrilled to be with you today to talk about the work of the Australian Animal Justice Party. In my presentation today, I'm going to be talking about how we came about, how a part of a global movement of political parties fighting to improve the lives of animals, and talk about some of the legislative changes we've been able to achieve. So I'm gonna jump right in and give you a bit of background. The Animal Justice Party was established in 2009, just 11 years ago. And it was born out of frustration that the two political parties in Australia, the Labor Party and the Liberal Party, were not paying enough attention to animal issues. Here in Australia, we face very similar problems to you in North America, such as intensive factory farming of animals, an extinction crisis due to habitat loss and land clearing, loss of biodiversity, cruel treatment of introduced animals, and just the general disregarding of animal interests due to the fact that they're classified as legal property. So those were all big issues around the time the party was formed. But I think there's really two main issues that come to mind that I think were pivotal in both forming the party and growing the party. Um, and the first was the slaughter of kangaroos in the Australian Capital Territory. Um, most of you would be aware that kangaroos are iconic native animals to Australia. It's what a lot of people picture when they think of Australia. But what a lot of people overseas aren't aware is that kangaroos are actually classified as pests in many parts of Australia due to their perceived competition with farmers. Um, and that means there's a whole commercial kangaroo industry that's developed that produces everything from meat to leather used on Nike soccer boots. Uh, so in 2009, just before the party was formed, there was a major kangaroo cull that was planned and ended up being supported by all major political parties, including the Greens Party, which I think was really disheartening for animal activists who'd always seen the Green Party as our closest ally and the most progressive on animal issues. And I think it really highlighted the need to have 
a political voice for animals, not looking out for the environment or at a species level, but actually thinking about the individual animals and protecting their rights. And that was a key event that led to the formation of the Animal Justice Party. The second event took place in 2011, just two years after the party was formed, and that was a major expose of the treatment of animals in the live export industry. Uh, for those who don't know, each year thousands of cows and sheep from Australia are crammed into ships and transported to the Middle East and other places where they'll be slaughtered. It's an absolutely horrific industry. The conditions these animals suffer on the ships for weeks at a time are dreadful. And when that was exposed due to undercover footage on national television, the public was absolutely outraged. And I think it represented a real shift. It was the first time that all of Australians were talking about an animal issue. And I think it made people realise, you know, just how big of an impact the government and political decisions can have on the lives of animals. And I think probably led a lot of people to start questioning and turning to groups like the Animal Justice Party. So the vision of the Animal Justice Party is an anti-species of society which recognises the sentience and intrinsic value of animals. Our goal is to fight for the interests of animals through the political system and fight for legislative and policy change which protects those interests. The Animal Justice Party is not a vegan party per se and many people who vote for the party are not vegan. However, we are very firmly opposed to the cruelties of animal agriculture in all its form and promote a transition to a plant-based agricultural system as soon as possible. It's also a rule that anyone who wants to represent the party must be vegan or transitioning to vegan. So it's definitely a core part of our work. Uh, but as a political party, we have policies on a whole range of issues affecting animals as well as humans and the environment. And I put just a few of these up on the slide. Obviously our policies go into a lot more detail that I can't cover today. But as you can see, we address issues like the legal status of animals and the environment, transformation, animal experimentation, the cool treatment of introduced animals, climate change, land clearing, and the list goes on. Uh, some of these policies and positions are more human focused. For example, our policy around a human economy and domestic violence, but animals always remain our focus. And that's just because their interests are so neglected in the political space. You know, the way I explain it to people when I'm talking to them is that we already have all the other major and minor parties focusing on human issues. It makes sense that we have at least one party focusing on the interests of animals, and that's the Animal Justice Party. I'm sure a lot of you are listening to this presentation and thinking, well, that sounds great, but could a political party dedicated to animals actually ever get elected? Is it a realistic platform for a, for a political party? And I'm thrilled to say that the answer is yes. In 2015, just six years after the Animal Justice Party was established, we had our first member, Mark Pearson, elected to state parliament in New South Wales. In 2019, we had two more members elected, Andy Medic in the state of Victoria and Emma Hurst in the state of New South Wales, who I work for. Unfortunately, we don't have anyone elected federally yet. This is a lot harder, but this has been such a huge achievement for a small party in such a small amount of time. And what this means is that animals now have a voice in parliament in two states of Australia, and it's really raising the profile of animal issues. And I think demonstrating to everyone that people care about animals and they're willing to use their vote to protect animals. Before I move on to talking about some of the legislative reforms the Animal Justice Party has been able to secure, I want to pause here and say that Australia is not alone in having a political party dedicated to animals. Something I think is incredibly exciting is that we're part of a worldwide movement of political parties that are all dedicated to advancing the rights of animals as well as humans and the environment. Um, in fact, in the past 20 years, there have been at least 20 political parties for animals established worldwide. And from those parties, nearly 160 representatives have been elected at national, state and local level in countries like the Netherlands, Germany, Portugal, France, the United Kingdom and others you can see on the slide. And there's many more that I couldn't fit on there. One of the great success stories has been the Dutch Party for Animals in the Netherlands, who have really been a leader and inspiration for animal parties around the world, including the Animal Justice Party. Since being established in 2002, they've grown to have six seats in their lower house or their House of Representatives and three in their upper house or the Senate, which is a huge achievement. And they've gone even further. The Dutch Party for Animals have now joined with other animal parties in Europe to form Animal Politics EU, a group which advocates for animal issues in the European Union and currently holds two seats in the European Parliament, so making a really big impact. This global rise of animal parties has not gone unnoticed. In fact, it's generating quite a bit of scholarship and attention. Um, one writer, Paul Licardi, actually undertook a study of some of these animal political parties. He studied their constitutions, their manifestos, their policy documents. And what he found was that more than just having common goals, these parties, which are all developed separately and in different countries, share a common ideology. And he coined that ideology the animalist or animalism ideology. 
and he found that all parties with this animalist ideology share one core value, and that was compassion, as well as a focus on recognizing equal rights and the intrinsic value of all living beings. And I think that sounds spot on to me, particularly in the work that we're doing with the Animal Justice Party. I think it's also interesting to note briefly that the growth of these animal parties is coming about at the same time that there is a political turn also occurring in animal scholarship. You know, in the past decade, we've seen authors like Sue Donaldson, Will Kamlicker, Robert Garner and Siobhan O'Sullivan all writing about this political turn and the increased interest in the treatment of animals as it relates to principles of democratic theory, citizenship, political legitimacy and the rule of law. It really feels like the time is right for political action for animals and scholars and activists alike are recognising and harnessing the power of political and legislative change. Uh, and I should note that I don't think this political turn has to be limited to the work of animal political parties. You know, I know a lot of people watching this conference are from North America, where it is much harder for minor parties to get elected, harder than, for example, in Australia or in Europe. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the North American parties, like the Humane Party in the US or the Animal Protection Party in Canada, aren't making a difference simply by existing and making their voices known in the political sphere and building their movement. Um, I also think the amazing work highlighted by Martin today in his presentation, particularly around his work on captive sedations, highlights that there's huge scope to be promoting political and legislative change for animals, even if you're not specifically working within an animal political party. So finally, I want to finish off today by running you through a few of the legislative reforms that the Animal Justice Party has been able to achieve in the past few years. I'm mainly going to be focusing on the achievements of my boss, the Honourable Emma Hurst, because those are the ones that I actually worked on so I can give you an insight into how they came about. Um, and on that topic, I guess some people watching might be wondering how we've been able to achieve legislative change despite being a minor party with only a few elected representatives. And I think it comes down to a few main things. Uh, firstly, being elected means you get greater access to other people in power. Uh, with Emma elected as a member of parliament, we can get meetings with minister and other powerful individuals that would otherwise be really hard for an animal advocacy group to get. Um, because we're working on the inside, we're in parliament every day, we're working with these people, we can build those relationships. And sometimes if we meet with the right person on the right issue, they'll agree to work with us on it. Uh, another factor that helps for us specifically in the state of New South Wales is that the government does not have a majority in the upper house or the Senate. They need votes from minor parties like the Animal Justice Party to pass their legislation. So that puts us in quite a powerful position and it means the government is much more interested in coming to sit down and talk to us and hear about our issues in the hope that we can work together and build those relationships. And finally, I think the mere fact that the Animal Justice Party has been elected and now in two states has been a big wake up call for the government that animal protection is a big issue and one that people are taking seriously. So I think that's made them a bit more willing to, to work with us on these issues. So I'm going to quickly run through some of our major wins over the past few years. The first thing we've been able to do is establish some really important parliamentary inquiries or what you might call Senate inquiries in the United States. And these have been into key issues like battery cages, which are still used heavily in Australia, the current crisis surrounding koalas who are predicted to go extinct in the state of New South Wales by 2050 if we don't take urgent action, the cruelty surrounding the kangaroo industry, as I mentioned earlier, the dairy industry and the use of animals in entertainment. In these inquiries, we get to invite experts to come along and give evidence and elected representatives from all the different political parties can listen and ask questions and eventually come together to write a report which makes recommendations to the government. Even if these recommendations don't get taken up, which sometimes they don't, it gives us a great platform to get media on these issues and also to educate other members of parliament and plant the seeds on these campaigns. Other times we get really lucky and these inquiries can lead to huge change. And that's what's happened in the case of our inquiry into animals and entertainment and specifically in relation to the keeping of cetaceans in captivity. So in my state of New South Wales, there's only one dolphinarium left and it only has three dolphins. So it was already a dying industry and this inquiry was really the nail in the coffin. The evidence produced to this inquiry about dolphinariums was really damning. And I should thank Marty who presented earlier for all his work that he get and help he gave us in pulling together some of the evidence for the inquiry. It really highlighted the serious cruelty of keeping dolphins in captivity and the fact that it's no longer supported by the public. So following the inquiry, the Minister for the Environment, who's someone who's quite progressive and who we've been working on building a relationship with, was persuaded to introduce regulations banning the import and breeding of dolphins in New South Wales for entertainment. This was an amazing win and one that activists have been fighting for for so long. It means that the three dolphins in New South Wales will be the last generation of dolphins in captivity in the state. 
And there were even talks about moving those dolphins to a sea sanctuary, which would be amazing. Unfortunately, we do still have some dolphins in captivity in Australia at a sea world in Queensland, but that's now the last dolphinarium in Australia. And we're absolutely keeping up the fight until we manage to see dolphin captivity banned nationally, just like in Canada. Um, another success we've had is introducing new laws which recognise the link between domestic violence and animal abuse. Similar to the United States, research in Australia shows that more than 50% of women leaving domestic violence also report that their animals were harmed, and many delay leaving violence, research has shown sometimes up to a year, because they're concerned about how they would take care of their animals and look after them when they've left. So it's a really serious issue, but one that we knew was being overlooked by the government. Um, because animals are classified as property in Australia, like they are in most parts of the world, they weren't being given any special recognition under our domestic violence legislation. And that's despite the fact that these are sentient beings, you know, part of the family for most people, and who can be victims of violence in their own right. So as soon as Emma was elected, she knew she wanted to make this one of her priority areas to address. And I think as a political party, anytime we can fight for changes that help both humans and animals is a real really good place for us to be. So after meeting with the government, working to educate them on this issue, we were able to achieve a couple of really big things. Um, the first was additional funding for women's shelters to upgrade their facilities, to allow animals to stay there. And this means that women can leave a violent situation, bring their animals with them and avoid being separated from animals in this time of trauma. Uh, the second thing we were able to achieve is new laws which better recognise the role that animal abuse can play in domestic violence, including making it clear that animals are actually protected under protective orders made by the court, and that threats to animals can be a form of domestic violence where the court can intervene. There's still so much more work to be done in this space, but coming from nothing, it was a really big step forward. We also managed to secure some legislative reform which ensures that people convicted of serious animal cruelty offences are giving mandatory lifetime bans on working with or owning animals. And this came about after we were seeing case after case where judges would find animal cruelty but either not impose an animal ban at all or only impose a ban for maybe one to two years which the community just did not think was enough and was really concerned that this person who committed a very serious act of cruelty would have animals in their care again. Um, so it's a small reform that we were able to achieve that means that when people are convicted of the most serious animal cruelty offences, it's not up to the judge to decide whether an animal ban is imposed. This will be imposed automatically and it will be for life. So they will never be able to own or work with animals again. And this is a small reform, but it's part of a much bigger project we're undertaking, which is overhauling animal cruelty laws. Uh, since the Animal Justice Party has been elected, three states have commenced major overhauls of their animal cruelty legislation. And these are laws that were written in the 70s and 80s and haven't been updated since. So the fact that they're being reviewed and in some cases are going to be completely rewritten and modernised is huge and something that I don't know would have happened without the Animal Justice Party being in Parliament and applying that pressure. I and mean, with the Animal Justice Party having elected representatives who actually get to vote on these bills, it puts us in a great position to actually scrutinise the laws and make sure they include robust protection for animals, not just paying lip service to it. I'm sure we're not going to get everything we want out of that project, but it's great that we're able to be there and be a voice for animals in the process. So that's all from me today. Uh, I hope in a few years I'll be able to come back and give you an even bigger list of what the Animal Justice Party has been able to achieve because we've got so much planned. Um, you know, Coming up in the next month, we're working on introducing a bill to ban puppy farming. We're looking at the link between children and animal abuse, trying to get animals released from animal experimentation and so much more. So I'm really hoping we're going to have more wins to report in the future. But for now, I'm going to wrap up. I hope this presentation has given you some inspiration about the power of political parties for animals and generally working in the political space for animals. Thanks so much for listening. and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. All right. Well, thank you all so much for those presentations. It is really interesting and inspiring to hear about the legislative wins for animals around the world. Now we will begin Q&A with our speakers. To submit your questions, again, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we actually already have some questions coming in. So I will start with a question for Marty. Um, it says, thank you for the presentation on Canadian legislative actions for whales, sharks, and terrestrial animals. I wonder how this momentum can be extended to legislative actions to outlaw the commercial slaughter of seals, Canada's panda bears, an animal, animal cruelty and ecologically damaging act hurting Canada's reputation in the world. 
Thank you very much for the question. Um, my focus as a parliamentary advisor has been very much on the Jane Goodall bill and these sort of related specific measures, but perhaps I could answer the question by talking about um, where there's momentum on a host of issues. So one important development that uh, in September was the re-election of Prime Minister Trudeau's government and his government ran on a very substantial animal welfare platform. In fact, um, three major federal parties in Canada had animal welfare platforms. And that was the first time I believe in history that any parties have. So that's a huge development. And specifically the current uh, or the newly reelected government ran on um, a platform of reintroducing or introducing a government bill to um, protect animals in captivity and as well to ban elephant ivory. So that is a huge boost uh, to the prospects for the Jane Goodall bill. And the, the government also ran on introducing a bill to ban uh, testing on animals for cosmetic purposes and to ban the export of uh, horses, the, the export of live horses for slaughter. So there's that's uh, a number of issues where there's momentum. There's also been momentum at the provincial level to ban a cat decline. Um, in terms of considering uh, the issue raised in the question or other issues uh, around legislative action, I would bear in mind, um, you know, the importance of building coalitions and building consensus. So if, if all of these issues could be achieved, that would be a lot of work and it would take still some years. So I would probably focus on where there is momentum for the current initiatives. Um, and then in particularly in legislative action, you would want to think about uh, where you think you could get support around particular issues in parliament. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for that, Marty. So now we have a question for Alice. Um, you discussed a law that was passed to protect animals during transport. The US also has a law designated to protect farm animals during transport, but it is virtually not enforced. Do you see similar problems with enforcement of transport law in the EU? How well is that law enforced? So, you know, I, I think it is always an interesting question, um, the discussion about passing laws and, and how great that is to get legislation passed, but then there's also that component of enforcement. So Alice, we would love to hear about that. Sure, thank you. Um, yes, so we do have a, a regulation on the transport of live animals, um, and we have the same issue of enforcement, sadly. Um, so it's a little bit, um, so the EU law is a little bit, um, it's more precisely drafted than the, the US 28 hour law. Um, and the enforcement issues is not so much within the EU, but for animals that leave the EU, uh, that are transported uh, alive to what we call extra EU countries. And this is, uh, this is a big issue because, so the issue mainly is that some member states do sign off uh, consignments, uh, that's how we call it. So basically they, they do sign off on um, trucks and boats and, you know, it's mostly, yeah, sometimes by planes, but that's not so much an issue um, that we know uh, for sure. Um, so we know for sure that the animals that will be transported to say Russia, Turkey, or um, some uh, countries in the Gulf um, will be transported in conditions that do not comply with EU law. Um, and that's an issue because the European Court of Justice actually handed down a ruling in 2015 saying that all animals transported alive outside the EU should be protected under EU law until they reach the country of destination. Um, so it's been a huge problem. The, the European Commission, the executive branch of the EU, hasn't really addressed that issue. So it doesn't really take, um, it doesn't really penalize those member states. So EU countries that do sign up those consignments, even though that they know that uh, they are signing off consignments that will not uh, comply with EU law. Um, I think what we can expect now is that hopefully, um, so EU animal welfare legislation will be revised uh, in the course of the next five years. Uh, so hopefully it will be revised in a way that enforcement mechanisms are a little stronger. Um, and also, you know, at a more systemic level, I think what's also a priority and that we shouldn't uh, forget about this is that we should produce less because uh, the reason we export animals is because we produce too much and so much so many animals that the EU market can 
can't even absorb them, which is a big issue. Um, and also another reason is because a lot of those animals transported, a lot of the transporters, a lot of the farmers who export those animals are subsidized. Um, there's a huge issue around the, sub, the subsidization of, of transport of animals that's, that's been a, an underexplored uh, topic in EU law. Um, so there's literally subsidies uh, that go towards the export of live animals. Um, so yeah, definitely an enforcement issue. Um, there's a, a, a ruling that's been quite uh, paramount, so that's good. Uh, but now uh, more legislative action is needed for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for discussing that, the, the difference between um, transport within the country and, and export outside of it. It's just interesting. This seems to be an issue in so many countries around the world. I know, um, Tess, you spoke to farm animal export um, in Australia. So I really appreciate that answer, Alice. Um, Tess, we have a question for you now. Um, this question says, thank you so much for your presentation. You talked about moving toward mandatory prohibitions on owning or working with animals as a result of an animal cruelty conviction. Can you speak to the debate between an approach like this one that bans people from owning animals um, compared to approaches that seek to identify and address underlying causes of animal cruelty behavior? Um, I know that that is, you know, there are so many approaches to dealing with animal cruelty out there. And so Tess, um, any, any insight or additional thoughts on that would be appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. So. I think, um, you know, being a, a minor political party for animals, you know, they say politics is the art of the possible. So, so that's part of the constraint that we're always working with um, in terms of what we can achieve for animals. So the mandatory animal bans was something that we felt we could achieve. Uh, and it was also something that we felt was really supported by the community. I'm sure it's similar in, in other countries that when you hear of these cases of animal cruelty and they receive really low penalties or someone's allowed to keep working with animals, you know, the community is really horrified by that, you know, not only um, from an animal protection perspective, but also, you know, thinking about that these are people out in the community working potentially with children and other vulnerable groups it sort of brings up this whole issue of the link and the violence involved there. So. Um, the mandatory lifetime bans was something that we felt we could achieve and, and felt it was important because the, leg the provision is restricted to the most serious cases of animal cruelty. So where there's intentional infliction of harm, torture, that kind of level, where I think there is some acceptance that maybe the, the rehabilitation side, it, it's sort of past that point that we need to actually take a protective step here to protect animals. I think there's so much scope to be working at the other end too, to identify the causes of animal cruelty, why is this happening in our society, how can we better uh, prevent this, whether that's through education or early intervention, and that's definitely something that we do as part of our work as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that answer. It really, really does require a multifaceted approach, and, and I appreciate you explaining um, uh, just how far we have come. So we have time for one, maybe two more questions. Um, this is a question addressed to Tess and Marty. Alice, I welcome you to weigh in as well. Um, it says you both spoke about the interests of marginalized human groups. What is your view on the question of whether animal organizations or political parties should also speak out on, um, if not advance, not, uh, human-centered social justice issues? And then they, they also ask, or is there a need for some animal advocacy organizations or political parties to be single issue focused? I think it's a really interesting question, you know, especially Tess, as you noted, with some of these animal parties um, being quite small and, and being kind of up and coming. So um, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. And that is, that is yeah, absolutely. all three of you. <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to speak briefly. I think it's a really good question. And it's one that we've battle with internally with the Animal Justice Party as well. How much do we focus on issues outside of animal protection? I think what it comes down to at the end of the day is that these issues are all interconnected when it comes to harm against animals, humans, and the environment. Um, you know, they're, they're all interlinked, particularly when we're talking about the climate crisis that's affecting us all. I mentioned the link between domestic violence and animal abuse. You know, when we're advancing the rights of animals, we're also advancing the rights of humans in the environment and vice versa in most cases. Um, I do understand there's a challenge about, you know, how much you focus your energy and resources on issues that are perhaps more purely human focused versus animals. But I think we've found generally that it's it's pretty easy because when you're starting with core values of compassion and kindness and, and looking out for the interests of, of everyone, then it's pretty easy to, to advocate on, on all issues in that sense. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, Marty or Alice, did you want to weigh in on that question as well? Uh, thank you. I can answer uh, quickly as well. Um, Senator Sinclair has spoken about a political alliance between, um, you know, on an Indigenous rights, environmental protection, and animal welfare. Uh, so that's very significant, and there's, I think, a lot of crossover in terms of uh, values in relation to nature. So I would definitely see it um, as an advantage to be uh, vocal on issues of social justice as well, and particularly with sort of environment as a theme that uh, connects sort of all these interests. And in, in the Canadian context of recent development was the recognition of or the adoption in federal law of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And, and the core, a core issue there is Indigenous jurisdiction. So in Canada, now that Indigenous jurisdictions have been more fulsomely recognized, there's a lot of opportunity potentially to work together as, uh, as partners. And I'd also make, uh, as one final comment, um, Senator Sinclair in his uh, speech on the bill, if anyone's interested, did talk about the importance of respecting traditional and sustainable uh, Indigenous uh, practices involving animals and one other quick point would be that Dr. Jane Goodall, I know, in her conservation work is heavily focused on uh, economic issues in areas, um, so, you know, Africa in particular with critics. Thank you. All right. I think we have time for one more quick question. Alice, this one is for you. Um, it says, I believe Switzerland is considering amending its constitution to prohibit factory farming. If passed, would Switzerland not be able to reject lower animal welfare products under the EU framework? That's an excellent question, actually. Uh, so Switzerland is not an EU country, but it is included on the EU market, um, which um, I think would mean that if that ban was passed, Switzerland would have to renegotiate uh, basically its trade agreement with the EU. Um, I wonder what would happen if a, a, an EU country would pass a similar ban, because the EU is not exactly, a I mean, it's not at all, actually, it's not a federal government. Uh, so national constitutions are actually above EU laws. Um, so that would for sure, um, yeah, trigger a lot of, yeah, legal questions that I, I probably don't have the answer to. Uh, and I'm sure scholars would, would have different opinions. Um, but yeah, in the case of Switzerland, it's, it's pretty straightforward um, because it's not an EU country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that answer. It is, it is interesting to posit what might happen. I think that is all the time that we have. Thank you all so much for your questions. I know that we were, well, we were able to get to some, we were not able to get to all of them, but we really do appreciate everyone tuning in and engaging and, and asking wonderful questions. Thank you all so much for joining us.